Welcome back, everyone. Next, we have Energy Plug Technologies Corp. It trades on the OTCQB under the symbol PLGGF and on the CSE under the symbol PLUG and is an energy technology company dedicated to innovation and sustainability with a focus on residential, commercial, and utility energy storage applications. Please welcome its chief of staff, Chris Barnes. Welcome to the conference, Chris. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who is uh, here today and willing to take the time to listen to this presentation. Uh, Energy Plug is likely pretty new to most of you. Um, our trading volume uh, on the NASDAQ is pretty much non-existent. So this is hopefully an opportunity to introduce our company and what we're trying to do to you. So you might have some interest. So Energy Plug, uh, we basically, we're doing a few things. Our main focus obviously is battery storage technologies. Um, and so we really are focused down on this idea of decentralized energy technology. So having smaller, more modular energy systems here on the screen, you can see on the left, that's a pole mounted battery system. And on the right is an actual uh, image of that system in the cabinet form, which is inside of that cylindrical shape you see on the left. And so these are meant to be small modular units that again, uh, this idea of being decentralized, which is very important, especially for the utility sector and enhancing grid energy uh, management resilience, which is obviously, uh, well, not obviously, we'll get into why, but uh, it's a ever concerning problem with uh, the global energy matrix and just being able to keep up with the increased demand. Um, how we do this, we have got really important partnerships with indigenous communities, global corporations, and uh, most importantly, we do have some great IP partners from Taiwan to uh, where we basically obtained a lot of the uh, property that we're bringing to the North American market. Bottom line, we are focusing on plug and play battery systems. And the other big piece that we'll get into is creating a Canadian North American made energy management system, which is uh, really the brains behind any battery system. So batteries themselves are pretty inert, somewhat stupid, and it requires uh, an ability to control the battery both charge and discharge to then make it actually useful and impactful for the grid at large or whatever the use case might be. Um, so here we talk about just, the, you know, why does this matter? And I think any of you who follow the energy market know that there's some big numbers being thrown around and for good reason. Um, a lot of the net zero requirements need huge investments into the grid. A lot of these, of course, this is not all battery purchases, but we recognize that with the increase in renewable influx into the energy mix, we know, most of us know that renewable power is intermittent by design, essentially, unless it's running river hydro or some other type of tech, but solar and wind, we know that's periodic. And so what we can do is we add battery systems to then capture the excess of those renewable um, power sources and then deliver them back to the grid when it's needed. See some huge numbers here, 4.1 trillion for maintaining existing grids. 17 trillion for expanding grids to meet new consumption. And uh, another statistic, this comes from um, Global Net Zero, uh, sorry, this is uh, bnf.com. And uh, 3.1 trillion needed for grid infrastructure updates by 2030 and a whole lot of 18 million kilometers of additional grid network. So anyway, big numbers, we, we know this to be the case. It's just highlighting that. Um, another big piece of why we could ask ourselves, why is there this, uh, such a large increase in power consumption? And it turns out the AI revolution, which many of us are becoming more and more aware of, is leading to a huge growth uh, in power requirements. And so in this statistic from Sprott, they've got at 17% of the U.S. energy in the U.S. is going to be from AI and data centers. So that's, that's a huge growth. Um, we'll get into some of our partnerships where we're actually looking to directly target that in part of our product matrix. And, uh, and of course... We don't even know where AI is going to go. I mean, a lot of these forecasts, this is future forward looking to 2030. AI is still so new. Um, I think it's uh, some, some of us in the, in the industry see that this is actually underplaying the, uh, the amount of growth that we're expected to see. And then again, the additional strain on the grid, which is why products like ours and solutions are going to be required to help alleviate that. If we look at uh, the other big piece that we want to bring to the table here is the energy management system. So there are a few of these in the market, of course. Uh, there are very few, however, that are North American based. And I think with, uh, as we are all, I'm going to use this term a lot that we're all aware of something. I'm going to make some assumptions that we're aware, but cybersecurity is a big deal, especially in the utility and energy supply space where um, it's, it's uh, energy is a huge part of our lives. And if we go without it for any period of time, it causes 
uh, major problems. So that becomes an attack vector from a cybersecurity point of view, as most of the utility and energy systems are all interconnected via networking of some sort. And so the energy management system, which is what we use to control our batteries, but also the various other uh, DERs or distributed energy resources that feed into a complex energy matrix, um, that all needs to be managed. And it needs to be managed from a system that can't be attacked. So our EMS system that we're developing in Vancouver, Canada, will be completely dom domiciled in North America and um, will be as hardened as it can get from cybersecurity and external risk factors which then make our products even more appropriate for utilities that need to ensure, they need to trust, but verify seven times over that uh, the systems they install are hardened and can't be attacked and exploited to then negatively impact the uh, energy mix and energy supply. And just, again, this number um, in terms of uh, the, the, the size of this market for energy management system, and this is outside of the hardware, this is a software solution, they, uh, this uh, from Fortune Business has it at 31 billion last year, up to 112 billion just for the EMS side. This has nothing to do with uh, the hardware side, which Energy Plug is looking to tackle both of those pieces. How do we make money is an important piece, uh, important thing to talk about here, especially as a, a small company as our own. So we made a few really important product partnerships out of Taiwan, as previously mentioned, and that's where we basically came with the, the hardware IP to bring to North America and to produce in our own Gigafactory, which you can see on the far right. But initially, we start with battery products. So we've got um, products. We'll get into the actual products. They're small and large size. Those are integrated with an EMS solution that then can tie in solar and wind and different generators. And that, of course, can then make the batteries uh, be as performant and impactful as possible. And then beyond that, we've also got the best solutions where uh, best battery energy storage system solutions that are customized based on different applications. So we see various use cases, be it a remote communications tower that's in Northern Canada that has to deal with minus 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and we've got other uh, potential installations that are, you know, so in Florida, right, we've got heat problems. So there is this need for somewhat of a tailored solution. You can't have a one product suit at all because of the various installation locations. We've got some installate one product that goes on a pole, another product goes on the ground. Clearly the installation requirements are different, but also just where in the world they are being installed. So, so that's the one big piece. Uh, then we've got, of course, our energy management system. And that is, again, as mentioned, that's used to coordinate and control all the various aspects of our grid. And um, so we, even if it's just a microgrid, we see uh, some really interesting applications that we're looking at where you have microgrids that have, say, a diesel generator or a propane generator on site. They want to add some solar. Maybe they've got a little hydroelectric opportunity. You need to be able to coordinate all of that to provide 100% uptime in your energy system. That's the goal of, of pretty much any microgrid is to have 100% uptime. And so that's made possible by having this well-balanced energy management approach, um, which is uh, something we're actively working on. Um, so, and then of course, a, a gigafactory. So we'll get into that next, but uh, we are in the process of launching and uh, building our own gigafactory on Vancouver Island in Canada. And uh, that gives us a bunch of advantages in terms of basically quality control and allows us to innovate on our product suite because we have that manufacturing footprint and the ability to customize things, implement new changes faster. And uh, as the, the market is advancing, which it is doing quite quickly, we tend to, we, we want to stay at the front of that um, with being able to evolve and iterate with the market as fast as we can with our product base. It also gives us some cost efficiency and supply chain security. Of course, not uh, the Gigafactory itself won't produce every component from dirt to the final product. We do have to still have supply chain from third party vendors. However, um, a lot of that uncertainty is removed by producing as much as we can within our factory itself. At the very top, I kind of skipped that, but basically yeah, the product release in November coming up very, very soon, we've got, um, we do have offshore manufacturing. So while our manufacturing facility in Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Island is being uh, built and it's expected to be producing product in a, just over a year from now, um, we do have the ability for our Taiwanese product partners to produce product in the meantime, to bridge gap and also to do some pilot programs, which is basically where we're at, testing some of these products. Um, and that includes then, so this product release you see for November 1st, including uh, our initial release of our energy management software in a couple months from now. 
So if we look at the Gigafactory itself, um, we are creating the, uh, this is the, the first in, Indigenous-led uh, Gigafactory. So this is built on Malahat Nations. Uh, they've got a, an industrial park there. We're building it um, uh, with them. And so uh, part of that on the right, actually, what's interesting is um, Vancouver Island, to many of you who may not know if you're from the U.S., uh, is a foreign trade zone. So this has been identified by the government of Canada as a, a special zone in Canada to help um, create some relief programs. You see a duty relief program, duty drawback, exporter processing services, there's custom bonded warehouses and export distribution center program. All of these are government programs to help facilitate um, both the just the logistics to make it easier to bring in, say, subcomponents for our factory on Vancouver Island and then and then ship out the final assembled products. Um, there's a lot of advantages for us as a company that come from having this location. So that's a very strategic thing for us. And on the left here, you can see, um, well, for top left, we plan to do one gigawatt hour of annual production of, of battery production. That's what it calls, that's why it's gonna be a gigafactory. And uh, we expect that to go COD um, Q4 2025, maybe get pushed to Q1 2026, but we're aiming for uh, the end of Q4 2025. And even with that, uh, we've got a lot of really interested product um, partners, both on the factory side and the product side. A lot of it coming from this idea that we are partnering with First Nations. And uh, there's some really interesting dynamics with the Canadian government and needing to do a 5% of procurement from First Nation sourced entities, which ours would count as. Um, so Siemens, uh, we've done an MOU with Siemens uh, earlier in the year, and they are collaborating with us on the Gigafactory manufacturing services itself. Um, they're looking at the software integration, both with our, our EMS, but also the control systems and factory management. Um, they're also uh, looking to support us uh, potentially with the hardware of the factory itself. There's These factories are no small thing, and they have a, a lot of very complex pieces of automation, uh, hardware and software that need to come together to, to make a factory a success. And uh, also just having someone like Siemens on side really does help with uh, the ability to do R&D on uh, other opportunities that they see that we may not have visibility to. And so it's a very strategic partnership for us that we're excited to uh, see flesh itself out over time. Now we wanna get into a bit of the products because that's really what it comes down to. So this is our 20 kilowatt hour storage solution. So these are basically a similar form factor. Um, these images look very similar to what we saw earlier. Uh, on the left is a basically a cabinet. It's uh, rectangular shaped essentially you've got doors on all sides and that is actually put inside of the rendering you see on the right um, so inside of that cylinder is in fact a rectangular shaped cabinet and so what we've done is it's kind of a really simple and obvious solution we've taken a ground-based very uh, full plug-and-play solution the 20 kilowatt hour has four five kilowatt hour lfp batteries with a PCS, so an inverter is installed, it has an HVAC installed, it has the control systems and all the comms pieces all installed into this one form factor. It's uh, PV ready, you can actually see on the left uh, image there at the bottom, those are MC4 connectors ready for PV. So it's one self-contained plug and play unit with our EMS. The batteries all individually have their own BMS, which is a battery management system. And that then talks to our EMS, the energy management system. And so the whole thing works together. And what we've taken is just taken that single form factor and mounted it on a pole. And so that uh, does a few things um, that we're, we're quite excited about. One is it just gets the ability to put these power units very easily in the urban environment where there are very, there can be limited resources in terms of just space on the ground. So we wanna be able to get these battery systems into the environment, put them somewhere where they're not gonna be in the way and have them look familiar to people. So we were actually requested by a big utility in, uh, in British Columbia to uh, create this product for them because they recognize the need of needing these decentralized energy solutions, um, but wanted it to look something familiar. And so that's the whole purpose behind the cylindrical shape. There really is no purpose behind the cylinder shape. Uh, it's dead space really, but, uh, but it looks uh, appropriate. And that, that often is really important in terms of being able to introduce new products into the environment where um, uh, civilians often, the whole nimbyism, they don't want to see something if they're not used to it in their backyard. So uh, nimbyism meaning not in my backyard. So that's the basic product suite. And so here, if we look more at the 20 kilowatt hour energy pack, so again, 20 kilowatt hours, you can see on the left there, it's four vertical batteries. Those are uh, five 
kilowatt hour LFP modules. Those are what will be produced in our factory uh, at, Mal at Vancouver Island. And um, so it's meant to be plug and play. This is for backup power, peak shaving, um, energy arbitrage, for example. Uh, it's got an integrated PCS or power control system, AKA inverter, and that uh, this is a bi-directional inverter that allows power to go in both directions and controlled uh, externally via our EMS system or programmatically from the EMS as well. So it can be automated uh, against so the automated backup right there. And so if there is a, an issue with uh, power dependent on the application and the desired outcome of the product, it can be all programmed into the EMS to provide that solar ready, as I mentioned previously, and it has the remote monitoring, which comes from the EMS for real-time control and optimization. The, uh, the, the This form factor, this is also IP65 rated, so that's rated for outside uh, installations and down to minus uh, 30 degrees Celsius uh, at its base. And if we go to the next one here, so a little more here, if we go to the far right, in fact, uh, this the, these st uh, statistics are uh, stats, I should say, are applicable to both this pole mounted unit and the cabinet. So it's an LFP module cycles, very traditional, you'd expect 6,000 to 8,000 cycles. So if you do about a cycle a day, that's, you know, over 16 years. Uh, the output for this is a 10 kilowatt, uh, 10, it should be, that's actually a typo, 10 kilowatt instant output from the inverter and it's 20 kilowatt hours of capacity. The output voltage is uh, basically meant to go because up to 20, 240 VAC or 208, it's got various uh, interconnection options. And the size there, that cylinder is roughly, call it a meter high um, and uh, over a meter in, in diameter, uh, or sorry, just under a meter in diameter and over a meter high. And so it's, uh, when a, a traditional transformer, some of them come, I mean, they can be that large. Uh, what's good about ours, however, is the weight. This it only comes in at about 240 kilograms. And so a similar size transformer is it's about a third the weight. So the poles are, are more than able to support these. And in fact, they can be installed. This pole mounted unit can be installed in threes. Um, so looking again, very similar to uh, what you'd expect to see from traditional transformers on utility poles. Uh, these can support then. So once they're plugged in and really the, the, the primary application of these is on the secondary side in a residential environment. So when you see these transformers, the traditional transformers, whether it be a powered mounted transformer or one on a pole, um, they take higher voltage, they step it down for residential use. Usually, typically you'll see 10 to 15 homes, sometimes even less that are fed per transformer. And so this goes kind of coupled with those units. And what that does then is we connect on the secondary side. So when that collection of homes has an increase in demand or surge, we can then supplement that. So that you see there that load leveling and peak shaving. So when we see a peak come from this collection of homes, we can then discharge our power to then lower that peak. And what that does, um, this is quite a few things. In fact, one of them primarily is it can reduce the strain on the transformer it's coupled with. One of the things I'm sure you're all aware of is the influx of EV vehicles into um, their energy uh, electric vehicles into the mix. Uh, governments around the world are promoting these. Uh, one of the downsides, however, that's not often talked about is when residents install their own EV charger on their home, that instantaneous spike in load that comes from an EV charger is roughly equivalent to about five homes worth of average consumption. So what that means is if we kind of, if we, if we just make the assumption, we'll do easy math, say there's 15 homes per transformer, uh, if you have of those 15 homes and that transformer is rated for 15 homes and those of those 15 homes, we start to see more EV vehicles come in with their own EV charger and everyone comes home from work at the same time and decides to plug in. That leads to very, very high instantaneous spikes in demand, which can cause these transformers to fail, if not uh, degrade them and, and cause a lot of extra heat and then wear and tear on the transformer. So by adding these modular units, they can then respond to that instantaneous drawdown, smooth out, smooth out those peaks to then alleviate the stress on the transformer and just generally on the grid at large. So if you can imagine a larger utility that uh, you know has, call it 100,000 poles, uh, which, is, which is normal for larger cities, if you distribute these pole mounted units throughout the city, that becomes this really broad based balancing effect that the utility has control over. So that's a really important piece that we're seeing a lot of interest from different utilities. And uh, we think this is gonna actually be the product for us that 
um, is very unique in the marketplace at this time and is where we've seen the most interest um, as far as what we're bringing out that could have the greatest impact on the energy mix right now. Um, if we move on here, so the other piece of our product line, so those past, those past bits are all based on a five kilowatt hour LFP module, and that's the base form factor for all of our smaller um, designs. We, I didn't show, but we also have a pad mount design um, and a few other smaller form factors. This is the much larger traditional battery energy storage systems that we're used to seeing. They really, the form factors converging around a 20 foot container. And uh, those are the density is really the name of the game here, price per kilowatt and getting as dense as possible. So here we also are looking to bring in a hundred kilowatt hour battery pack. This is a more traditional liquid cooled. The other battery we have is air cooled. Um, this is a liquid cooled immersion technology. And basically this will lead to a 20 foot container. That's a five megawatt hour in density system. Uh, very, very similar with what we're seeing in the market. One unique piece we can say is that the, the doors are only on one side and one edge. So at the bottom right there, you can see it allows for a horizontal stacking to reduce a little bit of the uh, ground footprint required. Of course, you could put some spacing if you would like for uh, for fire prevention to spread potentially between. Um, as, far, as far as thermal runaway goes, there is a uh, three leveled form of fire suppression in these systems. Within the module itself, it does a liquid immersion to quench any thermal runaway. And there's two other forms of, uh, of basic dispersion within the, the rack and in the container itself to help deal with any uh, fire concerns, which we know is, is it an issue with LFP that we're seeing in the market. So we wanna make sure that it's well addressed. So one other big piece that we wanna talk about is just this data center side. So we mentioned the AI data centers are becoming a huge uh, future draw on the grid. And uh, here we can see uh, Energy Plug. We're involved with, um, so on the left-hand side, we've done an MOU with a company called PowerTouch, and they are the uh, leading vendor for ASUS as far as their AI server technology. And so we're working with them to develop an integrated solution that um, is a bit modular and couples small BES with AI in, in a single container, with AI servers in a single container. And that uh, has a few things. It, um, it creates this modular approach. Any large AI data center do have backup power already. However, we create uh, if we create a product that's a little more bespoke as far as you can have just one or two containers, you can do smaller installations and have uh, that co-installed aspect of the, uh, the EMS then controlling the power that goes to the servers, ensuring that there's no interruption. In fact, and even improving the power quality to the servers, we're even seeing some evidence that when we add our system to be in between the servers themselves and uh, the source of power, we can actually increase the power quality to the servers, actually improving their lifespan. So that's uh, another side benefit. And we've seen uh, recently there was an uh, MOU announced in Canada here with DNG. They're one of the largest AI um, and, and data center uh, companies in Canada and with Malahat Nation, who is the, uh, the nation that we've also partnered with. We're a gigafactory. Those two companies are also working together to do a co-installed AI data center. So two locations to have that real redundancy, but then also we'll be adding seven and a half to 15 megawatt hours of battery systems to each of those installations. And uh, Energy Plug uh, is named in that, uh, in that MOU as being the, uh, the company to provide those. So we see that, and that's different than the modular um, AI data center container that I was speaking about. This is actually more very traditional. We just throw in a few of those 20 foot containers, five megawatt hours each, size them accordingly, and then use our, our EMS to ensure that everything is coordinated properly and uptime is maintained. When we talk about the EMS, uh, this is a slide that I will not read through all of, but just to highlight that there are a lot of data points that we are looking to cover. And um, you can see the battery models themselves have data points, the racks aggregated data points, the AC out, AC in, any third party assets. We wanna be able to monitor and control those. Battery level data here, the BMS, any faults and warnings, of course, we need to be able to uh, respond, receive and respond to those as quickly as possible. Cooling systems and fire suppression systems all tied into an effective data management system that uh, we, we plan to have in a couple months here. All right, uh, milestones. So where we've been and where are we going? Really uh, kind of three main tracks here. So we get the residential. I didn't even get into that because time is short. So we also have a residential five kilowatt hour, 12 kilowatt 
uh, unit that um, we didn't get any images here for that, but we, we've got that coming out. So that's on track. That will be manufactured in Q4, Q1, as shown on the far right. Um, and that, so that, that residential product and the utility product comes from Endwind Power, who is our uh, product uh, partner out of Taiwan. And both of those are, are with them. Uh, notably, we receive our first units uh, from them in about two weeks. We're expecting to receipt. Uh, we will be sending those to the NRC lab in British Columbia here to start to do some testing. And that's where we will be uh, validating and bench testing a lot of our early EMS studies and trials. And then that will then lead to um, some uh, installations with utilities. We're going to do a few pilot programs first. We've got a few of those in the pipeline now. Um, as, as mentioned previously, utilities are quite interested in this product for the obvious reasons. And um, so they want to see uh, what this can do and how does our EMS work. So that's all coming together. And then with the grid scale at the bottom, um, we had a different MOU, uh, different uh, IP partner. It's a CTEL out of Taiwan. I mean, there's really two different distinct products that can be tied together with our EMS, but they are, as far as the, the hardware, like the product itself side, they are different. Um, and so that unit, uh, that, that, that MOU is allowing us to bring the larger form factor as well to, uh, to North America through that. And uh, so just a quick, you know, this is the team. Got a bunch of folks, I won't go through them all, but a uh, pretty seasoned uh, team. We've got folks from uh, the U.S., Roman Fontes, for example. He's uh, with the U.S. Department of Energy. We've got a few folks who've been around on some other really big uh, battery projects like C. Primo there, who was the uh, advisor for us, but he was the uh, CFO for Corvus Energy, um, a very big uh, Canadian uh, battery company from the past there. Um, our CEO, Broderick Gunning, a very experienced guy, a lot of experience in EV infrastructure, kind of got him into this and um, definitely uh, the right guy to help bring us to where we need to get to as far as commercializing this product. And uh, Rampton Rasul Asad is our CTO, a very decorated gentleman um, with uh, two different Master of Sciences and a PhD in microgrid. He's probably the most decorated uh, energy battery guy I, I, I've come across. And fortunately he works with us. So uh, great to have him on board. And uh, finally, we've got our advisors here. And so or this is the board, sorry. And um, uh, yep, some, some names that uh, folks might know. Uh, Jonathan Redbird, a really important piece of this as far as the indigenous side. And uh, we're really trying to do more than just lip service as far as how can we engage with indigenous communities and help them help us, right? We see this as a, often a win-win-win scenario where it's not just one-sided, it's not just meant to be some form of... Uh, you know, just blanket reparation type of approach. It's no, it's, it's a true commercial partnership that, um, that has uh, capitalist roots where both, uh, both groups can, uh, can um, win here. And we see our, uh, the Gigafactory that we're building on Mal with Malahat Nation is actually something we hope to see as a model that can be rinse and repeat in, uh, in other scenarios with other nations and uh, recognizing that there's this huge demand for product and energy products, especially. And so if we can bring in more partners, especially indigenous partners who often have some land and um, are willing to work with us, uh, this is a great opportunity we see to expand production in time once we get our first set of products out into the market and uh, help, uh, help get our name out there so people uh, like yourselves know a little bit more about us and what we're trying to do. And that is it with three minutes to spare. So I. Uh, don't think there's any time for questions, Anna. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, we do have quite a few questions for you. Let's jump to the last one to see if we can get this in. Justin says, previously, it was estimated that EBITDA would be $90 million by 2028, given there are Chinese tariffs. Does that change that expected EBITDA? And what is the impact due to competition from hydrogen fuel cell companies? So as far as the tariffs go, we will be affected like everyone. We're not manufacturing the cells themselves. So the one thing to be clear about the Gigafactory is we will import cells. However, where those cells come from, we're completely agnostic. As long as they meet the certification, the specifications, they can be included in our products. So, so, we, so yes, in the meantime, while we're sourcing cells from China, there will be tariff issues. Um, we expect to onshore as much as we possibly can. We're talking to even companies in, in North America now that are going to be producing cells and maybe even some different technologies. So you mentioned hydrogen. Um, we see the, the energy mix being kind of a rising tide lifting all ships. So yes, there are other technologies out there that can provide 
uh, energy services and, and storage. We see LFP right now as being the one that's the most cost competitive and it's, it, it's effective. Getting 6,000 to 8,000 cycles for a daily, because most of these products are really a daily charge discharge. So you get 16 to 20 years. That's not a problem as far as we're concerned in the current marketplace. Um, we don't see the reason to venture into other more um, less proven technologies at this time. And after you sell them, Chris wants to know, is there maintenance? Are there contracts with the maintenance? D depending on the product. So for the EMS, yes, that's a, a residual um, piece because there is uh, like any, I don't know, Chris, where, what your background is there, but it, mostly any of these kind of remote monitoring services and systems that does come with a residual fee. Uh, the larger grid scale batteries, those will have an O&M that will come with it uh, because we do want to maintain the asset and make sure that they do meet their kind of intended. And the, because there's risk, right? We don't want these things to be misused. They can they can blow up. I mean, we're not blow up, but they can catch fire. And we want to ensure that the products we install are used appropriately with the installation. So, um, so that's the larger scale. The smaller stuff, however, the utility, we don't see any reason to get involved. We want to sell those to utilities and to third parties and have them. The O&M is actually pretty basic. Uh, there's, I mean, the batteries, it's, it's air cooled, it's solid state. There's really not much there. Uh, it takes about a year. Every year you open it up, have a look, make sure everything's good, close it down. Um, so it's, it's really pretty simple O&M on that smaller um, pole mounted unit, especially because it's a bit of a pain to get to. Wonderful. Well, Chris, we are out of time. We do have questions for you, but we'll send them to you so you can answer on your own. But thank you for coming on to the conference today. And please come back. We would love to follow along with your updates. Awesome. Thank you very much, Anna, and everyone else for your time. All right, everyone. We'll be right back with our next presenter.